Okay, I'll get started on today. Actually, before we do a couple, oh, sorry. Uh, well, they have problem for Yes, I'm gonna uh, write some later today and hopefully post them either later today or tomorrow morning. Um, so yes, uh, quiz is on Friday. It will be about infectious disease models. The uh, the mathematical techniques are not really changing that much, right? So the things that we've learned before for our consumer resource or our competition models, finding equilibria, finding stability, Ralph Hurwitz conditions, sketching phase planes on all kinds of all of those things are essentially the same mathematical techniques. So we're applying them now just to a different biological context. So the biology's changed, but the, the underlying mathematical techniques have not changed. So a lot of the things that you would have learned previously will still be the same math, right? There is a few things like we're going to talk today about the basic reproduction number. Um, that is, you know, there's a couple of things in terms of new te terminology, a disease-free equilibrium or an endemic equilibrium. What does it mean to have density or frequency dependent transmission? So th there's a few more things here over these course of lectures where you should definitely learn up some of the, the terminology when we, we talk about these things. But mathematically, there's not so much um, in terms of new techniques or things to learn. OK, so I will upload some, but don't worry that there hasn't been sort of specific problems so far on these things because you will be asked to do similar things that you've been asked to do previously. Um, so that was one announcement about the quiz. Um, the other thing is, unfortunately, next week, um, I have to be away. Um, Monday is uh, Remembrance Day, so there's no lectures on Monday anyway. Um, Wednesday and Friday of next week, um, Aline McPherson, who's one of my colleagues, um, who's also a professor in maths, she will be covering those lectures. Okay, so they'll also be on infectious diseases. She'll be covering those, so they will be in person. She won't be recording them, though. So um, especially for people who are listening to the recording, Next week's lectures, there will not be recordings of those. So I would encourage you to be there in person. Um, okay, any other questions before we get started? Okay, so last time we uh, started off thinking about infectious disease models and we met the SIR framework, so susceptible, infected, recovered framework. Uh, today we're going to be diving a little bit more into analyzing this model before we were just constructing it and thinking about the different components there. Today we're going to be thinking about uh, questions like when does an epidemic take off, um, what happens to that epidemic, and how many people get infected over the course of the epidemic. So that's today, and then Wednesday's lecture will be thinking about a variation on this uh, type of model, and likewise the lectures next week will be thinking about adapting this, this basic framework in a few different ways. So at the end of last lecture, I mentioned this quantity R0, which is the basic reproduction number. We'll be talking a bit about that today and what it means, uh, especially in the context of an epidemic threshold. So when does an epidemic take off? Uh, ideas about the, the critical post-population size or density that we need to, to have an epidemic. And then finally, the final size of an epidemic as well. OK, so at the end of the last lecture, there was a self-study problem. Um, non-dimensionally the SIR model. So we had an SIR model that looked something like this. And there was some ODEs associated with that. So we had a DSDT, DIDT, and DRDT. And then the self-study problem took you through doing some uh, parameter substitutions and, and variable substitutions so we could rescale time according to the uh, average infectious period. And then rescaling the susceptible, infected, and recovered proportions as U, V, and W. So U is now the proportion of hosts that are susceptible rather than the density. V is the proportion that are infected and infectious, and W is the proportion who are recovered. So we've now switched from the SIR, I mean, we've still got the SIR framework, but the SIR equations to these equations here, where we use the fact that the population size was constant, and therefore we could divide by n, n wasn't changing, and this gave us these equations here. We're now down to just one parameter essentially in this model, r naught. This is the basic reproduction number that I mentioned before, and we showed that that was equal to beta times by n, n is the population size, s plus i plus r, divided by gamma. Beta is your transmission rate, gamma is your recovery rate. So this is your basic reproduction number, and this is essentially the only parameter that matters in this model. 
Okay, so it only we only care about that quantity. Obviously, it depends on these three different parameters, but all that really matters is what those three parameters give you. Okay, so if you increase beta, if you double beta and half, sorry, if you double beta and double gamma, then your R naught would stay the same. Okay, so uh, it doesn't matter if you double your transmission rate and double your recovery rate, you same end up the same basic reproduction number and the same qualitative model here. Part of that is because as well, we've rescaled time according to the average infectious period. Okay. So if we were back in the original SIR model and you uh, doubled your transmission rate and doubled your recovery rate, you would uh, increase the speed of your epidemic. So it would occur over a shorter time period, everything would get squashed down. But because we've scaled time according to the average infectious period here, it will actually have functionally no effect on this model if you double both beta and gamma. Okay, so quick question here. Why do we not need the third equation? So we've got three equations here. We don't actually need our third equation to analyze this model, or at least not for the most part. So why is that the case? Yeah? Because it was some of the target equation. Yep, so we said S plus I plus R was equal to N, which was a constant, right? So that means that we could write uh, our equation is equal to n minus s minus i. So if we know what the population size is, we've got our equations for s and i. We can work out r. It's just the same here. Now we've got u plus v plus w equals what? Yeah. Yep, because they're proportions. We've got equations for u and v. Therefore, we can write w as equal to 1 minus u minus v. So we still have this equation here, but we don't actually need to use it to, to work out you know, whether an epidemic takes off. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about this basic reproduction number. So like I said, it's the most important quantity in mathematical epidemiology. Um, you may have also seen this a bit during the pandemic discussions about R0. Um, we will see later in the course that this helps you define things like not only when an epidemic occurs, but also what's going to be the final size of that epidemic. Um, you can work out things like the, the initial growth rate of an epidemic from this R0. If you have a little bit more information as well, we can uh, do things like uh, calculate approximate vaccination thresholds from this R0 that work pretty well um, and see you know, why things like childhood diseases, um, like measles, have a, a very, very high um, vaccination rate required um, to give you something called herd immunity. So there are lots and lots of different ways in which this R0 are important. And the... You know, we had a, an expression on the previous slide, R0 in this model is equal to, oh, sorry, my thing's gone a little bit crazy there. R0 is equal to B to N over gamma. But there's also, you know, this will vary depending on the model, you know, what our R0 is going to be. There's also a, a verbal description of this. So the basic reproduction number tells you the average number of secondary infections produced by one infected individual in an otherwise susceptible population. So it's kind of like a word thing to, to take on board. The main, you know, you can break it into three parts here. So we have the average number of secondary infections, which is basically saying, let me highlight it, it'll be easier. There we go. Average number of secondary infections. So if you're infected, how many people do you expect to infect during the time that you're infectious? Okay. So average number of secondary infections saying it produced by one infected individual. So we care as a sort of per capita element here. So per infected individual, how many new infections is that individual producing? And then finally, in an otherwise susceptible population. So we're basically saying everyone is susceptible. That's why we have this N up here in our R naught, because we're assuming that the number of susceptibles is basically the same as the population size. And we want to see essentially what is its fastest growth rate. This is related to something called RT or RE, or people write it in different ways. This would be the effective or time dependent reproduction number. The only difference here in our model is this would equal beta S over gamma. So you can see these two things would be equivalent when S is equal to N at the start of an epidemic, when everyone is susceptible. This effective reproduction number is telling you how many infections each infection is producing at a given moment in time. So 
One of these is given moment in time, the effective reproduction number. If you take that all the way back to the start of an epidemic when everyone is susceptible, then you'd have the basic reproduction number R0. Okay. So another way of thinking about this is it's the ratio of the rate at which new infections are produced by each infected host when the entire population is susceptible. So in our model, this is just B to N. So each infected individual, or there's only one infected individual at this point, they are producing, this is the force of infection, so beta times by S, where S is equal to N here. So how many new infections are they producing? And then we're dividing this by the, the rate at which um, infections are lost, gamma. Okay. So you can think of this R0 as being new infections produced per unit time. by, I'll call it removal or loss. So in our model, that only occurs due to recovery, but this could be due to things like quarantining, or um, it could be due to migration of people leaving the area, or it could be due to things like disease-associated mortality. So kind of from the perspective of uh, a pathogen, when a host recovers, or if the host dies, has essentially the same effect. So that's why your disease-associated mortality terms would appear in this denominator as well. The key thing that really bugged me during the pandemic is I never thought actually I would actually see people talking about R0 on the TV. Um, it was in a movie, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen Contagion, movie with Kate Winslet back in, I don't know, 2010 or something. It suddenly shot up at the start of the uh, start of the pandemic. Everyone started watching it on Netflix, I think. And that she actually explains Arnold really well. So if you ever see that movie, um, that's like the one time I'd seen it previously mentioned in the media. But during the pandemic, people were talking about the R number. We need to get the R number um, below a certain level. Talking about R0 to this compared to other pathogens. One thing that people kept on saying though is, this is the basic reproduction rate. But this is not a rate, this is a number, okay? It's dimensionless. It's important because we, you know, anytime you're talking about a rate, there needs to be some kind of unit here. But you can think of, uh, there's gonna be a contact rate per unit time within that beta, and then there's a recovery rate, which is also per unit time. So the per time elements of these things cancel out. Okay. So this is dimensionless. It can be called the basic reproduction ratio, but not the basic reproduction rate. Okay, over to you guys. What I want you to do is to have a go at finding and determining the stability of any equilibria. So find your equilibria and determine the stability of them in this model. Things will go wrong. So you should expect something weird to happen. Unlike all of our previous models where we found, you know, here is a, an equilibrium, now I can find my stability. When you go to find the equilibria, you should notice that there's something a little bit strange about this, okay? So have a think about what that actually means biologically, okay? And then have a go at finding the stability if you can. In fact, don't worry so much about finding the stability, I would say just find the equilibria. And I'll put the equations back up here in case you haven't got them written down. Okay, so like I said, this is a little bit strange, or at least strange compared to what we've looked at previously. I'm going to start by thinking about this dBdt equation here. So when is this equal to zero? I have the bit in the brackets is equal to zero. So u must equal one over r naught, or b must equal zero. So db dt is equal to zero, it only happens if b is equal to zero or r naught times by u minus one is equal to zero, which means that u must equal one over r naught. Okay. Let's think about this first one. So if b is equal to zero, so we've got no infected individuals in the population. Just go back up to my equations up here. If V is equal to zero, then du dt is also equal to zero. 
And that's true regardless of what value I have for you. If you as a half, a quarter, a third, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what value you I have. If V is equal to zero, then both of these equations are equal to zero. So if V is equal to zero, du dt is equal to zero as well. And that's true for all u. So that means that, remember, we're in a, a three-dimensional system here, really. We, we've been talking about it as a two-dimensional system because we don't need the third equation. But if we write it out for all three of our variables, u, v, and w, u star, 0, and then 1 minus u star is in equilibrium for any u star between zero and one. We'll come back to that in a moment, what that means. If we just think about this second one here, if u is equal to one over r naught, du dt is equal to just minus v. And this is equal to zero if and only if v is equal to zero. And this one here is contained in this one here, this is when v is equal to zero. So we have to have v equal to zero to have an equilibrium in this system. So we have to have no infected individuals for there to be an equilibrium. And when there is, or when there are no infected individuals, how many equilibria do we have? Not you, because I've already, already discussed this. Someone else. How many equilibria do we have given by this statement here? Infinitely many. Sorry? Yeah, infinitely many. Yeah, you both infinitely many. So any proportion of susceptible individuals with zero infected individuals and then one minus however many are susceptible is an equilibrium. That's weird because before we've always had these distinct equilibria, right? Rather than an infinite line of equilibria, which is what we have. So you can think of this as being a three-dimensional space, right? You've got a U axis, a V axis, and a W axis, just like you'd have an X, Y, Z axis. And there's a line going through that three dimensional space, which is given by, which is in the U, W plane, which is given by this U star here, one minus U star here for W, gives you an equilibrium. So when U star is equal to one minus, uh, yeah, I won't go into that again. So, this, is, this second one here, when u is equal to 1 over r0, v is equal to 0, that's contained in that set of points, so we can ignore that one. How if we summarize this, then we'd say there is an infinite number of equilibria in the u plane, w plane. And this is along the line w is equal to 1 minus u. Okay, so that's kind of that's kind of weird. Let's think about tackling this another way then. So suppose initially that almost everyone is susceptible. So this is back into our r naught scenario, right? So this means that u at time 0, so our proportion susceptible at time 0 is approximately equal to 1, very, very close to 1. Let's ask a different question. When can an epidemic take off? So for an epidemic to take off, we need dvdt, our proportion that are, in, are infected, which if you recall is r naught u minus one brackets times by b, be greater than zero. So we need when the entire population is susceptible roughly, and this u is approximately equal to one, we need this to be greater than zero. So if u at t time zero is approximately equal to one, then we need dv dt is equal to r naught minus one now, approximately, times by v to be greater than zero. And do a little bit of rearranging here because we're assuming that v, v is very, very small, but not actually equal to zero. So we're assuming essentially we've got an infinite population here, 
everyone but one person is infected. Uh, sorry, everyone but one person is susceptible. So we can, this is non-zero, so we can divide through by this. And this actually gives us essentially a per capita growth rate for the infection. And there's only one in that individual who's infected here. So divide through by V, we're going to get R0 minus 1 has to be greater than 0. In other words, R0 has to be greater than 1 for an epidemic to occur. And conversely, if R0 is less than 1, then an epidemic is not going to occur. And biologically, this should make some sense, right? If we go back to our definition up here, our wordy definition, the basic reproduction number tells you the average number of secondary infections produced by an infected individual in an otherwise susceptible population. So given that everyone is susceptible, that's like the best growth conditions, if you like, per capita for infection. Everyone that they come into contact with is someone that they can infect, as opposed to a case where someone might be immune or someone else is infected already. Those contacts don't add any new infections. Whereas this time, every time they come into contact with someone who's susceptible, they'll be able to infect them at least in principle. And so the average number of secondary infections produced that, by that infected individual has to be at least, one second, has to be at least greater than one. In other words, they need to be replacing themselves and more so in order for the epidemic to, to take off. So if, for example, R0 is equal to two, then on average, that first individual and likewise in a large enough population, those first few individuals that are infected will each be infected on average two individuals. So say they're infected for a week, they infect two individuals in that week, but each of those two individuals will infect roughly two individuals as well. And so if everyone's mm -hmm. infecting two individuals, then things are going to grow exponentially. If they're infecting less than one individual, then they're not replacing themselves and therefore it's going to decay. Sorry, you had a question. Uh, yes, my question is about uh, the people who are more likely to get infected. Uh, are these people are like anyone who can't bring the contact or people who, I know that like, okay, if we have, we don't have any like vaccine or mm -hmm. immunity. So the sub, uh, these people are everyone or like for COVID there was group of people who were more likely to get sick. Very, very, like very good questions. So. In this particular model here, if you remember in the when we were constructing this, one of the assumptions that went into this was that there's no heterogeneity or variation between hosts. So we were assuming that everyone was susceptible, everyone had the same behavior, there was no variation in how often they were coming into contact with people, how likely they were to get infected, or how likely they would be to die in this model. There's no death in this model, but you could add a death term, and that would be the same thing there. That being said, there's nothing to say that we couldn't extend this model and we'll be doing various extensions. Um, one of the lectures next week should be about risk structured models where you could build in different classes. These are different compartments or classes and there could be in a, a class here uh, grouped by say different age groups. You could have young people and old people. Young people say might be more likely to catch it because maybe they're more social or going out to clubs and things like that but maybe they don't die as much, so they have a different death rate. Older people may be less likely to catch it, but may have a higher death rate. So you can stratify these models and break them down according to things like risk and age. So yeah, very good question. Um, a classic one in which that is done is uh, for things like sexually transmitted infections, where you have, say, a high-risk subpopulation, um, for example, sex workers who have a very high number of sexual contacts and therefore can drive epidemics. So there are definitely cases where you want to structure the model um, according to things like risk of uh, infecting as well as potentially risk of dying as well. Okay. Very good question. Okay, let's think about doing a bit of geometric analysis. So we've worked out that this R0 must be greater than one for an epidemic to occur. We can understand why that happens mathematically from these equations, but also biologically from the definition of R0. Okay. So just by knowing what whether we're above or below that threshold tells us whether our, our epidemic is going to be growing or decaying. And that same principle applies for our um, effective or time-dependent reproduction number, RT or RE. Okay. So if RT or RE is greater than one, then our infection is going to be growing. 
If it's less than one, then they're going to be decaying. Okay, let's think about some geometric analysis. So we've been do doing lots of things like sketching phase planes before. So let's think about what a phase plane would look like for this system. Again, it's a little bit different now because we're dealing with proportions rather than, say, independent population sizes. So before we, say, had a predator population size and a prey population size, or vice versa, um, those two things would be independent. So you could be anywhere in that you know, uh, positive quadrant values for those predator and prey populations. Now, because we've rescaled this model according to u plus v plus w being e uh, equal to 1, that means by definition that u plus v has to be less than or equal to 1. So we can't be anywhere in that positive quadrant. It's actually going to be a triangle. So there's going to be a diagonal line if we're in the uv plane, but you can't go above u plus v equal 1. Okay, because always you'd be above the, the proportion. So we have to take that into account when we're sketching our phase plane. But in terms of finding our null clines and our direction fields, that's exactly the same as what we've been doing before. Okay, so let's think about our null clines. In this case here, well, we just worked this out essentially when we were looking at our equilibria. Du dt is equal to zero if and only if u is equal to zero or v is equal to zero. And dv dt is equal to zero if and only if u is equal to 1 over r naught, or v is equal to 0. OK, so we've got four null clines, but these two here are identical. So we actually only have three null clines now. They're all straight lines. So it's nice and easy to work with. And then let's think about our direction field. So let's think about what happens on the line u is equal to 0. So on u is equal to 0, the u dt is equal to zero as well. So if u is our horizontal axis, we have to be moving up or down. We have to be moving up or down on this one here. So let's think about dv dt. So dv dt, remember dv dt, I'll just write it up here. This is equal to r naught u minus one in brackets times by v. So if u is equal to zero, dv dt is just going to equal minus v. And so this is less than zero for any v greater than zero. In other words, we're moving down. So on this line, u is equal to zero, we're always going to be moving down. Let's think about our other null clines. Let's do v is equal to zero next. So v is equal to zero, u is equal to zero, and u is equal to zero. What's our direction of movement? In the UV plane. No exactly. So no movement. And that should make sense as well, because remember when V is equal to zero, this was our line of equilibria. So by definition, whenever we have V is equal to zero, our populations are not changing. Okay, finally, the other null plane we have is U is equal to one over R naught. So here, dv dt is equal to zero by definition, and u dt is going to equal, we had minus r naught times by u. So that's going to be one over r naught times by v. So this is, again, less than zero for any v that is positive. What does that mean here? We're talking about du dt, so that's going to be moving left. OK, so we have all the information now we need. So we're going to sketch two phase planes to understand the dynamics of this model. OK, so let's have a go at sketching these. We have U and RV here. And remember, we're going to have this line going down here where we've got U plus V is equal to 1, intersects the axes at 1. And so this region up here, we can never enter that yellow region because u plus v would be greater than 1. So our phase plane has to be constrained to this bottom triangle here. OK, what else do we have here? Let's sketch on some of our null clines. So we had a null cline for du dt when u is equal to 0. So that's going to be this vertical line here. 
we also had an old line for du dt when v was equal to zero. So that's this line here. These are du dt equals zero. We also had an old line for v when v was equal to zero, which makes it a little bit harder to sketch, but what I'll do, I'll make it dashed. I'll try to make it dashed. There we go. So that's just saying that there are the V and the DV DT and DU DT lines coincide. DV DT is equal to zero. Okay. So I don't have to sketch this out. I'm just going to copy it again for a second. So these things will stay the same. But what we're going to do is we're going to think of a, a, no, a phase plane on the left-hand side when R0 is less than one and one where R0 is greater than one. So everything here stays the same. If R0 is less than one, that means that my other null line for dv dt, remember this was u is equal to r1 over r0. 1 over r0 is going to be greater than 1. So that means that this null line appears to the right hand side of this triangle. This is the line u is equal to 1 over r0 when r0 is less than 1. I'll sketch on this, this side here. If R0 is greater than one, that null cline is going to appear somewhere within this triangle. Okay, now let's think about our directions. So our directions on this slide here, the first one on the line U is equal to zero, we're always moving down. So that's this green vertical line here, we're always moving down. On V is equal to zero, so that's on the bottom axis, there's no movement, so no arrows along the, the horizontal axis. And then on the vertical line, U is equal to one over R naught, we're always moving left. So we always have to be moving left here. In fact, we can never attain this, just included it for completeness here. But this one here, we are moving to the left. Okay, so what does that mean? That means in this triangle, we're always moving down and to the left. That's our net direction. On the right-hand side, in this region here, we'll be moving down and to the left. But in this region here, the DVDT is equal to zero here, so we're not moving up or down here. On this side, DVDT is negative. Here, DVDT is equal to zero. So what's dv dt going to be in this triangle? Positive. So what does that mean for our direction? So here we're moving down to the left. dv dt was negative. What direction are we going to be moving here? Up. Yeah, up and left. up and left. Okay, great. So here we're going to be moving up and to the left. Okay, so let's think about what some trajectories look like. So we're starting u plus v is equal to one. We don't have to start with u plus v is equal to one, but this would be assuming that we're starting with no one in the population who's initially immune, okay? So suppose we start off down here. This is a particular value of u. So we've got a high value of u. So most people are susceptible and there's a small number of people who are infected. We're always moving down to the left, so our trajectory is always going to look like this. Suppose it's something a bit more 50-50. Again, we're still always moving down to the left. All of our trajectories, regardless of where we start, end up looking something like this. But note they all end up going to a different point along this line. This is our line of an infinite number of equilibria. Our trajectories always go down to the left, but they're not getting pulled into one point. They're just ending up at some point along here. And the point at which you end up at depends on how many susceptible individuals you started with, so where you were on this line here. 
So that's when R0 is less than one. The number of, and notice, I'll just slide that then. The number of uh, infected individuals is always decaying. Okay, we're always getting pulled down here. Okay, what about this one here? Well, if we take somewhere over here, this is just like our graph on the left-hand side, our phase plane left-hand side. We're moving down to the left here, so we're always getting pulled down here. Let's suppose instead we start off somewhere down here where most of the population was susceptible. The proportion was greater than one over R naught that was susceptible. Here we're moving up and to the left. So now this curve is going to grow like this. We have to cross that null line horizontally, and then we start decaying. Depending on where we start, affects where we cross that null line. So again, we're still getting pulled down to one of an infinite number of equilibria. But the key difference here is that what's going on on this side, as far as our sort of epidemic is concerned. If I zoom out to remind you what's on these axes. So here, the number of infections is always falling. What about over here, say? Yeah, so our number of infections increases or the proportion infected increases. It reaches some peak and then falls. Okay, so we can see from this geometric analysis that when R0 is greater than one, what's really happening is this, or as we vary R0, this red null line is shifting. We always move down and to the left when we're on this side of it, and we would move up and to the left on the right-hand side of it. So this is varying situation when the peak of our epidemic would occur. Here, our triangle is to the left of it, so our peak has already happened, so we're always decaying. When I say the peak has already happened, what we're really saying is that there aren't enough susceptibles to maintain epidemic growth. Whereas when we keep moving this line to the left, and that is now inside this triangle, here on this side, we've got enough susceptibles in this bottom right triangle here for us to grow. When we pass through, we don't have enough susceptibles to keep um, maintaining growth. So what this really means if we think about our reproduction number, our time dependent or effective reproduction number, here it's greater than one because our epidemic is growing, here it's less than one, and so our peak epidemic, or the peak of our epidemic occurs when our reproduction number, our RT or RE, is equal to one. Yes. And then all those trajectories, they're starting on the, that sort of uh, that straight line mm -hmm. the other one because there's no there's no proportion of recovery and then we wouldn't be having the same one. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So this was only because we were assuming that everyone is initially susceptible. Okay. If not, then they wouldn't start on there exactly. Okay. There's also obviously a, a third dimension to this, which I've drawn this in 2D, but in reality, there would be a W dimension as well, where the number of uh, infected, sorry, the number of recovered individuals would be increasing as well. Okay, there's a couple more things I just wanted to quickly go through today. One is this idea of a critical population threshold. So if we know there are R naught, if you're calling this model as beta n over gamma, and we want this to be greater than one to have an epidemic, well, we can rewrite this in terms of our population heist. So just a quick bit of algebra, we can write n has got to be greater than gamma over beta, which gamma and beta are just, they're just rates. They give you a number if you take the ratio of these two things. I'll call this nc, which is a critical population size or density. So this is saying that if we don't have enough individuals who are susceptible, and that should make sense from here, if an n gets small, we'll eventually fall below R0 being, sorry, R0 being less than one, therefore we wouldn't get an epidemic. Whereas if we have more and more individuals packed into a smaller space, essentially if we increase the density, then eventually we'll breach this threshold. So how do the transmission rate, population size, and recovery rate affect whether an epidemic will occur or not? Well, if beta or n increase, that makes it more likely 
that you get an epidemic. So if our transmission rate goes up or our population density goes up, and if our recovery rate goes down, this is basically just saying that people are infectious for longer. So that should hopefully be fairly intuitive. Okay. One other thing that we can use Arnold to work out in this, this simple model um, is what is the final size of an epidemic? So question we often like to think about is, okay, there's an epidemic happening. How many people or what proportion of the population is gonna get infected during the course of this epidemic? Okay, so what can we work out using this, this simple model? Part of the issue of this, if we just go back up here, is remembering that we have an infinite line of um, uh, possibilities here. So it's not just a case that, you know, if we had an equilibrium, one equilibrium, we'd be able to work out just by reading all that equilibrium is, is what's the final size of that epidemic. Here we have to think about where we're starting off from, as well as like um, the, the growth rate of that epidemic. So depending on its R norm. So any point V is equal to zero is a disease-free equilibrium. So I'll talk about DFE sometimes. It's just shorthand for disease-free equilibrium. Um, it basically means that the epidemic eventually burns out. And this is given by U star zero, one minus U star for some U star between zero and one. Our final size of the epidemic is the total number of individuals who became infected over the course of the epidemic. And so if we see all individuals are initially susceptible, then it's just going to be given by the number of individuals that end up in this class here. So one minus U star. So we're saying that we're starting off essentially at something close to this. This is our initial population. Everyone is susceptible initially. Just before we introduce the infection, there's no one in the recovered class. Okay, so how do we work out this final size of the epidemic? Well, if we go back to our original equations, now is where we're going to actually use our um, dw dt equation. Our du dt equation was just minus r naught uv. And we had an equation dw dt was equal to v. So using these two equations, we can divide the second one by the first one and work out the rate at which our recovered class is changing as we vary our susceptible class. In other words, dw du is just going to equal minus v over r naught uv. These cancel, so you get minus 1 over r naught u. Okay, so this is just this is just a differential equation, right? We've got w's, u's. We've no, we've got no time dependence now. We've got a parameter. We've got a u. If we solve this then as this equation for w, and then use our initial condition where w is equal to zero, u is equal to one, then that means that we can find a relationship between this w and u that's valid everywhere on our what's called our solution trajectory. And we can start this arbitrarily close to our disease-free equilibrium, one, zero, zero. So this I'm going to leave as a self-study problem. This will take you through the different stages. It turns out that our final size of our epidemic, we can't actually write down an analytic uh, solution for this. We have some uh, final size of our epidemic, WF, is given by this equation here, 1 minus WF is equal to B to the minus R naught WF. You can't get WF by itself in this equation. But what you can do is you can sketch a straight line. This is just a straight line, 1 minus WF, and this is an exponential. So have a go at first of all doing the integration. So integration by parts, oh, sorry, separation of variables, I should say, to do this integration. Then think about showing the second part here. And then finally, sketching these two um, these two lines or a line and a curve to see when we get the what the final size of our epidemic is. Okay, so you won't get a natural value, but it will give you an indication of where it is roughly. Okay, and think about what happens as R naught gets bigger. 
Okay, I'll leave that exercise and, and upload the notes, uh, all the solutions to that. That's it for today. Any questions?